The Carolina Panthers wide receiver core left a lot to be desired in 2023. Now enter Deontay Johnson as their wide receiver one. Can he be the true number one wide receiver that Bryce Young and the Panthers need? We'll talk about it right here on Locked on Panthers. You are Locked on Panthers, your daily Carolina Panthers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of the Locked On Panthers Podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, as always, Julian Council, talking Carolina Panthers with you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday as we are in off-season mode. So be sure to subscribe or follow the show for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Then beginning again on July 15th, we'll be back to your team every day, which is our motto here on the Locked On Podcast Network. And on on today's show, we'll continue our positional breakdowns of the Carolina Panthers heading into 2024. So far this week, I talked about the quarterback position here in Carolina on Wednesday's show, talked about running backs, and today, going to talk about wide receivers. Last year, I had a lot of concerns about the Panthers' wide receiver group. I felt like Adam Thielen, who came off of a solid season in Minnesota with the Vikings would provide something positive for the Carolina Panthers in 2023. My question though was what would he do at age 34 in year 24 and what he could do at age 35 in year 25. But last year, 33 in 23, wasn't all that concerned about Adam Thielen. That proved to be a lot better than I could have expected when he had over 100 receptions and 1,000 yards receiving last year and truly was the only positive part about the Carolina Panthers wide receiver core. The draft pick, Jonathan Mingo, did not live up to the second-round billing last season. Terrace Marshall got lost in the fold and was barely even active at the end of the season. Lavishka Chenault turned out to be the guy I told you he was. Not a Debo Samuel Light, not even a playmaker at all at the NFL level and then DJ Chark was the biggest disappointment of them all as he could not catch the football and just did not make the kind of plays that we had seen down at Wofford during training camp that never carried over to the regular season the Panthers wide receiver core turned out to be a lot worse than I thought they were going to be I felt like they'd leave a lot to be desired but they turned out to be the worst wide receiver unit in the entire NFL this offseason, the Panthers needed to go out there and bring in some more talent, and they've done that by drafting Xavier Leggett in the first round. But before that, they made a key trade by bringing in Deontay Johnson here to Carolina. So starting off the conversation today, the biggest story about the biggest player, biggest name, in my opinion, the biggest name heading into this year at the wide receiver position is Deontay Johnson. Certainly, you can have an argument about Xavier Leggett, I'm not going to place those expectations on him right now as Carolina has already come out and said that Deontay Johnson is going to play the X position, that he's going to be the number one read. And he has said himself, Deontay Johnson has said that he's here to help Bryce Young. He has articulated that to the coaching staff, to the media and to Bryce himself. So he is the top story in my opinion, when it comes to the wide receiver group here in Carolina and the Panthers made an excellent trade. Dan Morgan, plenty of questions about whether he should have gotten the hallway promotion from assistant general manager to GM after being here the past three seasons where the Panthers have been abysmal, but he's a different man than Scott Bitter, and David Tepper liked him, and also understand that David Tepper's options weren't all that plentiful considering his reputation as the worst owner in the NFL now that Dan Snyder is no longer the owner up in Washington. But what a trade Dan Morgan made, trading Dante Jackson, who they were planning on cutting and a sixth-round pick to the Pittsburgh Steelers for Deontay Johnson and a seventh-round pick. So effectively, they got rid of a player that they were going to cut anyways and really only swapped a sixth for a seventh to get a top wide receiver here on the roster. Last year, Adam Thielen was the team's de facto number one because DJ Chark wasn't worth a damn, because Jonathan Mingo wasn't quite ready yet, Terrace Marshall Frank Reich literally forgot about him in one of the games last season. And then you look also at LaVishka Chenault, just wasn't going to happen. Amir Smith-Marset didn't really get a lot of opportunities. Adam Thielen was healthy. He was the only guy open, and he was the guy that Bryce Young leaned on all year long. But this year, 
Deontay Johnson adds a different element as a playmaker. Not that Thielen can't make plays, but I would not expect him to put up the kind of numbers he put up last year. And I would expect that in a situation where Johnson is the number one read, like Thielen was last year, that he's going to be able to make more plays and offers more explosiveness than what Adam Thielen offered for the Carolina Panthers last season at age 33. Looking back at when this trade was made, we'll talk about the pros and the cons of bringing in Deontay Johnson to Carolina. Excellent route runner. Something that all the Panthers receivers struggled at last year, not named Adam Thielen. He provides that speed, twitch, and playmaking ability. Something, again, that all the Carolina Panthers wide receivers, and this time including Adam Thielen, really struggled with last year. And I do wonder whether he truly is like that alpha wide receiver one. When you look at the rest of the league, you look at the top tier kind of guys, and maybe that's kind of stretching things, but he's not a Justin Jefferson. He's not a Jamar Chase. He's not um, any of those kind of guys when you really think about it. But can he be good enough for Carolina? I think so. And he has the credentials. Johnson has second team all pro as a rookie in 2019 as a punt returner, which speaks to his playmaking ability. Pro Bowl in 2021, the last time he had a capable NFL quarterback throwing to him. 107 receptions, 1,161 yards, eight touchdowns. And in that season, PFF overall grade was a 77.9, 25th out of 128 wide receivers. And his receiving grade was a 79.1, 23rd out of 126 qualifying receivers. And the big thing, too, is he's got to be able to separate. And he is an elite separator, which the Panthers really struggled to do last year. He averaged 2.9 yards separation last season, five yards after the catch, 58.62 catch percentage. But going back to that Pro Bowl season in 2021, 3.2 yards of separation, 5.1 yards after the catch, and then a 63.31 catch percentage during that 2021 season playing with Big Ben Roethlisberger in Pittsburgh. In the last couple of seasons, the quarterback situation in Pittsburgh has not been advantageous for a player like Deontay Johnson, who was on the rise in 2021 to continue that trend, which has led to people thinking he has a diva mentality. When Mitch Trubisky and Kenny Pickett are throwing you the football and then the best option after that becomes Mason Rudolph, I don't think it's on Deontay Johnson that he was not happy about what's happening with his quarterbacks. He's already gotten his second contract, but he wants to get an even bigger contract after this season. And it's hard to do that when your quarterbacks are inaccurate, cannot make the plays that are necessary to even lead your team to a first down. So I completely understand where Deontay Johnson was coming from in Pittsburgh. Now it will be important that the, the Panthers keep him happy. And when you tell him your ex, your number one read, we're going to get you the ball. I think he'll be happy. Now, Bryce Young has to hold up his end of the bargain, and so does the offensive line to give Bryce Young an opportunity to hold up his end of the bargain. I think this is a situation where Johnson will be a lot happier, and there were questions about his drop history, but you look at it, it was really only one year. Back in 2019, he had six drops. 2020, his second year in the league, had 13, then five and 21, seven and 22, two and 23. DJ Chark, who's really struggled with drops. You go back to the Jacksonville game where it had been three drops on one possession, and maybe not all three of them were considered drops, but really when you look at it, those are three plays you got to be able to make, at least make one of them as they were all downfield throws. Shark had a 6.1 drop percentage last year compared to Johnson with a 2.3 drop percentage. And when you look at it, Shark wasn't the number one last year. The hope was he could be a number one. This is kind of a replacement to DJ Chark as the playmaker with speed, with the ability to actually separate, which DJ Chark could not do last year. So the question I have is, is he truly a number one wide receiver? Or is he more of a de facto? Don't really think it matters. He can get open. He can make plays. He's proven to be a Pro Bowl talent. And now you have him and Adam Thielen, albeit at age 34, two guys who have been Pro Bowlers in their careers and two guys who can get open, who can catch the football, and at least one of them in Johnson can do something with it and make some plays. And that was desperately needed for the Panthers this offseason to bring in a player of his caliber and to be able to do it by getting rid of John De De Dante Jackson, rather, who you're going to cut anyways. And basically swap a six for a seventh. That is good business for the Carolina Panthers. A great job by Dan Morgan. Let's hope it works out with Deontay Johnson this season. So Deontay Johnson, he'll be atop of the wide receiver depth chart. 
How do things factor for Adam Thielen and Xavier Lee get Jonathan Mingo and the rest of the wide receiver core? I'll take a look at the depth chart here in just a moment on Locked on Panthers. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die. You'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit, only available to U.S. customers. Let's take a look at the rest of the Panthers' depth chart. As I said, Deontay Johnson, and not really what I've said, it's what's been stated by Dave Canales and what Deontay Johnson has shared with the media. He's the X. He's going to be the number one target for the Panthers, the number one read. So we know he's going to be a top depth chart at the X position and one of the three starting wide receivers. Looking at the rest of it, Adam Thielen, had an incredible season last year, a late career renaissance, someone who I wondered when he became a free agent if he wanted to come to Carolina, an uh, organization that, yes, had gone 7-10, and 10, new coaching staff, and the hope was that the Panthers would contend. And that was his expectation, and unfortunately, that did not come to fruition. But he's still here in Carolina after putting out some sentiments during locker room clean-out day back in January that maybe he didn't want to still be here, but he's still here in Carolina and a key piece to this wide receiver room heading into the 2024 season. Last year, 103 receptions for 1,014 yards, only four touchdowns, but it's on 137 targets, the most targets he's had since the 2018 season when he had 152 and was a Pro Bowl player there in Minnesota the year prior. That also had a ton of targets. So to get that amount of targets, at his age 33 season was great for Thielen, but also spelled the issues the Panthers had with the rest of the wide receiver group. And he's been able to, been able to separate. I talk about Deontay Johnson, NFL next gen stats, had him at 2.9 yards separation last year. Right there, Adam Thielen, 2.9 yards separation. He had the 11th best catch percentage in the NFL at 75.18, but a league worst average yards after the catch above expectation at minus 1.1 yards. So lost a yard basically every time he got the ball, which was not necessarily the best thing to hear, but still solid player last year. He had a 72.7 Overall PFF grade, which is 44th out of 128 wide receivers, 75.3 receiving grade, 34th out of 126 qualifying wide receivers. He was a above top half receiver last year for the Panthers and in the NFL. And I'm not expecting. 103 receptions again. I'm not expecting a thousand yards or four touchdowns. And if I go back to his last season in Minnesota when Justin Jefferson obviously was just outstanding. He had 70 receptions, 716 yards, and six touchdowns. That's what I want from Adam Thielen this year. Like, that is really my expectation. If he can get more than that, outstanding. But I would not expect Adam Thielen to have another 100 reception season, 1,000 yards receiving. If he can give us 70 receptions, 700 yards, and six touchdowns, that's great. And that's really what he had been doing the year prior as well in 30 in 2021, 67 receptions, 726 yards and 10 touchdowns like that. Really the 10 touchdowns like that's what I would love to see from Adam Thielen this upcoming season. My expectations are right there around 65, 70 receptions, 700 yards and maybe about five to seven touchdowns this season. I would call that a good year for Adam Thielen. When you think about Deontay Johnson should really be taking over the Thielen role as a guy who could have 100 receptions, 1,000 yards, and then maybe get about eight, nine touchdowns this upcoming season. The rest of the receiver core, Xavier Leggett, he's coming in. First round pick, the Panthers decided that they could not wait another day. They had to have their guy and the fifth year option. Fortunately, Dan Morgan has a relationship with former assistant general manager here in Carolina, Brandon Bean, from their time spent up in Buffalo, and he was able to make a trade that made sense for both parties as the Bills wanted Keon Coleman, who they took later on in the second round, and the Panthers wanted Lee Get, who they also wanted to get the fifth year option with. And this is a guy who didn't do much 
uh, at South Carolina as we went over until his final year. His first four seasons as a Gamecock, 42 receptions, 423 yards, five touchdowns. Last year at South Carolina, 71 receptions, 1,255 yards, seven touchdowns. He was the fifth Gamecock in history to have 1,000 yards, joining Sidney Rice, RIP, Alshon Jeffrey, Farrell Cooper, and Sterling Sharp. So some high-level names there for that big-time SEC program. And it's, well, I guess not big-time, but that SEC program in South Carolina. So I'm expecting him to be number three guy. I think he'll return some kicks. He'll try to find some creative ways to get him in the football. Just temper expectations. He's going to get a lot of snaps. I am expecting more out of Leggett than what we got last year out of Jonathan Mingo. Just don't expect this guy to come in the league and take it over by storm. Yes, physically imposing. A lot of guys at this level are physically imposing. Maybe not so much at the receiver position, even though there are guys out there, but across the board, there's plenty of physically imposing players. He's stepping up in weight class after not doing a lot at South Carolina. Losing his parents certainly could have played a role. Injuries certainly played a role. Having different quarterbacks, not having high-level quarterback play, different head coaches, receiving coach, all that. That's all a factor. And it all came together his final year there under Shane Beamer last fall. Just manage your expectations. Don't ask too much out of this guy as he's someone who the Panthers want to eventually be maybe their number one or number two. I don't know how they want to look at it, but he's going to be a big factor in the future. It just does not have to be now when you have – Thielen coming back again, and he put up big numbers, and you brought in Deontay Johnson. That takes pressure off of Lee Get. So hopefully he can come in, play well, put up way better numbers than Mingo, but then also show some promise, and people can not go crazy if he doesn't do outstanding things right away. Jonathan Mingo last season came in and was immediately slotted into the wide receiver three role in kind of a way like Xavier Lee get. And it's interesting how the Panthers took Terrace Marshall Jr. A couple of years ago. Then after two seasons, Mingo came in to replace Terrace Marshall Jr. And then after one year, I'm kind of wondering, has time already run out for Jonathan Mingo? Different coaching staff than the one that took him. It's still a general manager who was here last year when they took Mingo. And he says that they still like him. You brought in two more receivers, something that you had to do, absolutely. And when you look at it, Johnson could be gone after the season. Thielen could be gone after the season. It could be Lee Gett and Mingo as the top two options in Carolina next season. And Mingo is going to have to show a lot more than he showed last season. He had the fifth worst catch percentage in the NFL, according to NFL Next Gen Stats, at 50.59. His PFF grade was brutal, 54.7, which is 110 out of 128 receivers. Receiving grade, 52.6, 116 out of 126 wide receivers. 43 receptions, 418 yards. Goose egg when it came to touchdowns. Likely going to be the wide receiver for this year. And my hope for him... And for the organization is that Mingo can show enough where if he can put up the same numbers, scores a couple touchdowns, he's not going to be getting the same amount of opportunity as he got last year unless there are injuries or he takes someone's job as that big receiver in a slot. If he can put up those same numbers, add some touchdowns, show better precision his route running and ability to get open, that can be a positive moving into 2025 when there may be more expected of him as a third-year player in Carolina. Going over to Terrace Marshall Jr., who was replaced by Mingo last year, and now there's just a pretty big unknown of what is going to be expected of him here under Dave Canales and his coaching staff. But Canales came out uh, last week during uh, mandatory minicamp, and he talked about how he's excited to do but they got to really wait till the pads come on and we've seen Terrace Marshall show promise 28 receptions 490 yards and a touchdown in 2022 as the wide receiver two and especially in the latter part of that season was a good player for them and you were thinking that was going to be the jumping off point to him having a breakout season potentially in 23 Frank Reich and the rest of that coaching staff did not see it that way as he had a record uh, setting day as far as receptions, nine receptions, career high against Minnesota. Then the next week when they go to Detroit, 
doesn't play. And Frank Gray comes out and says, oh, man, it's my bad. We should have got Terrace in there. Basically forgot about him. Not basically did forget about Terrace Marshall. And even when Frank Reich was gone, he was a healthy scratch in seven of the last eight games in 23. Then when he had to come in to replace Mingo, who was out with a foot injury, lined up incorrectly, bringing back a touchdown. And then you kind of see how you can forget about Terrace Marshall and why he wasn't playing for seven of the last eight weeks. And the only reason he got a jersey that final week was because of Mingo being injured. I don't know. I really don't know whether he makes the roster. I don't really know if he's going to get an opportunity. This guy is going to get a lot of playing time, I think, during the preseason. Let's see it. You're going to get an Andy Dalton, who is an experienced player throwing into football in those situations. So it's not like he shouldn't be able to make plays. Amir Smith Marset last year, more of a gadget guy towards the end of the season at eight receptions, 51 yards, eight rushes for 74 yards, and a touchdown. We get a chance to prove himself as a wide receiver this season. Just mention the top three names Liget, Johnson, and Thielen, those are going to be top guys. I don't see why he can't potentially get more of an opportunity than Terrace Marshall. So we'll see how that works out. Probably more of a special teams guy. David Moore, who is now in his second stint in Carolina, will he actually make the team this year? TBD. Played in seven games last year for Tampa. Five receptions, 94 yards, and a touchdown. He has not played significant snaps since he left Seattle following the 2020 season and was not even in the league in 2022. So not high expectations for him. Two guys that are UDFAs that I find very interesting, Jalen Coker. And these are the words from Dave Canales when he was asked about him, saying size, instincts, top of the route, ability to separate. He's really crafty in zones. He knows how to find the open spaces, has a little cool run after the catch, too. He can break some tackles because of the size that he brings, a tax ball at the high point. I mean, the guy really does have a cool skill set that he brings to us. That's Dave Canales during OTAs, talking about, a undrafted free agent wide receiver from Holy Cross. Now, Steve Smith Sr. also has said positive things about Jalen Coker. And I saw Coker was on a Panther podcast on YouTube, and he was talking about he felt like he had the best opportunity to play by coming here to Carolina. He's Holy Cross's all-time leading receiver in yards and touchdowns of 2,715 yards and 31 touchdowns. He was given... $225,000 in salary guarantees and a $25,000 signing bonus to sign here, which is a significant amount of money to give an undrafted free agent. And looking at the opportunity, not really knowing where Terrace Marshall Jr. stands, Amir Smith Marset probably see more of as a returner more than anything. And even looking at Jonathan Mingo, there's an opportunity for Jalen Coker, also an opportunity for Sam Pinckney coming from Coastal Carolina. In his past two seasons there at Coastal down in Conway, 143 receptions, 2,023 yards, 11 touchdowns, another big-bodied receiver who will get pointed opportunities during the preseason to show what he's worth. Mike Strawn, he's also back. Frank Wright guy, don't expect really anything out of him. Cam Sims, likely just going to be a camp body. Those are the wide receivers here in Carolina. So how many will they keep? The Panthers kept seven last year. Will they keep seven this year? We'll talk about it here in just a moment on Locked on Panthers. How many receivers will Dave Canales and the Carolina Panthers offensive coaching staff keep once they have their initial 53-man roster in late August? Looking back at last year, now different coaching staff, understand that, different offensive philosophy, understand that, and the circumstances are always different everywhere you go. But looking last year at Carolina, they had seven, Adam Thielen, DJ Chark, Jonathan Mingo, Terrace Marshall, LaVishka Chenault, Amir Smith-Marset, and Derek Wright. And as I always tell you, just because a guy makes the roster does not mean that he'll still be there once they have the waiver wire open and put in their waiver claims. Derek Wright was a casualty, and he was able to stick around on the practice squad, but he made the initial roster, which was great for him, but also kind of heartbreaking because he had to have known it was a little unlikely to last long. So seven receivers, a lot for the Panthers last year. Looking back at Tampa a season ago where Dave Canales was the OC, they only kept five. And then in Seattle, where a large portion of this coaching staff is coming from on the offensive side of the ball, they kept six. So just looking at it as far as tiers go, guaranteed roster spot, roster bubble, likely practice squad player or not going to be around at all. Looking at guaranteed roster spots, Deontay Johnson, obviously, Adam Thielen, obviously, Xavier Leggett, obviously, and then Jonathan Mingo. Mingo, second-year player. I don't think he's going to be someone who gets jettisoned when there's so many people still in this front office that were a part of the group that drafted him. And Morgan's words, are they believe in him still, and he's still a young player, and understanding that Deontay Johnson could be gone after the season, Adam Thielen 
could be gone after this season. Mingo could still be in their future plans. I just don't think he's in their right now plans. And a lot of the moves they made this offseason were really about the future. Didn't give a bunch of high price free agent deals for guys to be here for the next four or five years or really just one, two year deals. And they brought in some rookies at positions during the draft that you and I and plenty of us did not believe were positions of immediate need. A different approach. As we had seen over the last couple of seasons, it felt like the Panthers were always chasing after a playoff berth just to go win five games, win seven games, win two games. Now, different approach. And I have to think that they brought in some guys because he had to do something offensively. He had to bring in Deontay Johnson. That's going to bring Mingo down to the pecking order. And then he had to bring in another receiver through the draft and Lee which they've done. There can still be a future in Carolina for Mingo to be a good player. I just don't think that this season he's going to get that many opportunities, but I still think that he's safely going to be on the roster. Now looking at guys on the roster bubble, this is all dependent upon how many you want to keep. They want to keep five. They want to keep six. want to keep seven. If they're only going to keep five, who it's tough. Um, like Amir Smith, Marset kickoff returns. That is something that we don't have much understanding of as far as, who are going to be those guys? Xavier Leggett did that at South Carolina. He has the speed to be able to do it. And he was clocked at like the fastest speed of a wide receiver in college football last year, maybe the fastest speed of any player in college football last year. And I would think he's going to get those opportunities. And if he's going to get those opportunities, is Amir Smith Marset still someone the Panthers need? Now, he was the primary punt returner last year. And I'm not seeing a lot of guys right now that I think would be in that role. So if they're going to keep five, Amir Smith Marset likely is that fifth receiver. Now, if they're going to keep six, is it going to be Terrace Marshall Jr.? Or is it going to be Jalen Coker, who the coaching staff brought in and who they paid a pretty penny for UDFA? I would kind of want to lean with Coker. You already know what Terrace Marshall Jr. is, and you can save a million dollars against the salary cap if you let him go. And he would have to really impress. He'd have to start, like, this, this thing. Terrace Marshall makes the roster if he's able to go out there and, like, beat out Legat. Like, that's the only way I can see it. I just don't see how they're going to allow him to beat out the get when he is their first round pick and Marshall's on the final year of his deal. But he's on the roster bubble. I I don't feel very confident that he'll make it, especially if they're only going to keep five or if, the, if they're going to keep six, they're going to keep seven. Then, yeah, he's probably got a decent chance to make the roster. But if it's only be five or six, he doesn't play special teams. And if you're going to be a back of the roster kind of guy at the receiver spot and you don't play special teams, you're not going to play, which is why he was inactive for all those weeks because he didn't play. Like Amir Smith-Marset, he may not be someone who that staff last year had a ton of plans for offensively, and this staff might not have a ton of plans for him offensively as well, but he can return kicks for you. Marshall's not doing that, and that is what would keep him off the roster. Jalen Coker, he'll have to make it special teams as well uh, by being a contributor there. Um, but maybe he brings more to the table. I don't know. I mean, Marshall was a second round pick for a reason. And it just has not worked out. Now the rest of them are, I all see as practice squad guys, David Moore, uh, because he understands the offense, knows coaching staff is a veteran makes the most sense that he would be a practice squad guy. I don't think another team is going to want to pick him up off the waiver wire. He probably would rather be in Carolina anyways with these Seattle folks. So he seems like a prime candidate. Sam Pinckney and same thing with Coker. If he doesn't make the roster, both those guys seem like players that the Panthers would want to have on the practice squad if they're not able to make it. And I think it's unlikely that Pinckney does. And I still think it's also going to be not a long shot, but it's going to be difficult for Coker to make it. As well, and if he does, there's other players out there who may be available that the Panthers like uh, with the waiver wire, knowing that the first waiver claim, Mike Strawn, Frank Reich guy, I can't see him sticking around here. Cam Sims, another kind of likely practice squad guy as well. So yeah, that's where that's how I see the 53 man. I I can't really tell you how many they're going to keep. I, I I know that there's four, like right? Deontay Johnson, Adam Thielen, Xavier Lee, Gap, Mingo, and I feel like Smith Marset. After that. Because here's the thing, here's the thing. We still look at it, the depth. Johnson Thielen, known commodities. Leggett, not even known, but going to get his opportunities. Mingo didn't do a lot. There's not a lot of depth here. So if there's not a lot of depth, is there much reason to keep more than those five? Is there much of an argument really for Terrace Marshall Jr.? You, you like the idea of Coker, even though you've never watched him play football. 
So does it make that much sense to get a UFA, or do you wait to see Ross cut down and see who else is available out there, or if there's a veteran who's been rehabbing? Because I think Michael Gallup's still someone who's available. Does it make more sense to go that route than to get a UDFA that's probably not going to play that much anyways? Just, that's just a question I have for y'all and something to marinate over over the next couple of weeks. But we'll see. I'm excited to see uh, Coker and Pinckney and what some of those guys can do. And, of course, we get. Um, but that's how I think that things are likely going to shake out when it looks at the when it comes down to the roster projection for the wide receiver position here in Carolina. But that's going to wrap up this edition of the Lockdown Pages podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, hosted by yours, Julie, Julian Council. Again, y'all subscribe, follow the show for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And be sure to follow me on Twitter at Julian Council, where the weekly Friday mailbag will be back at the end of July on Monday. We'll be breaking down the tight end position in Carolina. Have the Panthers finally found a replacement to Greg Olson. We'll talk about all that on Monday. But in the meantime, be safe, be happy, be whole. As always, keep pounding, and I'll talk to you all on Monday.